All right, so we're going to go back to chapter six now and pick up where we left off last time. So I just want to quick, quickly remind you <clears throat> that last time we were looking at three basic concepts that form part of the mathematical field called combinatorics, which is the science of counting. This is all an important part of probability theory. First, we had arrangements. Okay, and then we had um, combinations and permutations. Now, what is the difference between the three? Well, the arrangements, a collection of objects, um, or I guess what I should say is these are different orderings of a collection of objects. Like for example, if you have three posters that you wanna put on your wall, um, how many ways are there to hang them? Each one of those choices would be considered an arrangement because you're taking the same three posters and so they're changing their order. With a combination, it's a little bit different because you're choosing some objects from a larger collection. This is a um, set of objects chosen from a larger collection where the order of selection does not matter. Okay, that's the keyword right there. It does not matter. So um, remember we had a case where, um, I think we had a case where we were choosing toppings for our haagen ice cream. <clears throat> the order in which you select those toppings doesn't make any difference to the final ice cream because you're just putting them all on, on top anyway. So, um, and there's so many other examples we can think of. Uh, let's say another obvious example would be, um, imagine you're at a salad bar and you're told that you can have, um, let's say, three different dressings, and or you can pick three out of five, or uh, I shouldn't say dressings, maybe toppings, like for example, croutons or grated cheese or um, you know anything else. The bottom line is with a combination, the order of selection does not matter, and that's the opposite of permutations where the order of selection does matter. Okay, and how do we calculate these? All right, so let's just quickly review that. Um, with arrangements, let's say uh, we could say that there are n factorial possible arrangements of n objects. And if you recall, n factorial is, and don't forget it's pronounced n factorial, is defined as uh, zero factorial is just one, one factorial is one, two factorial is two times one, three factorial is three times two times one, and then it goes on and on from there. Four factorial is four times three times two times one, four, four uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's do one more. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one, which is 20, et cetera, et cetera. Now, your calculators do have the ability to calculate these. You don't have to do it manually. Uh, let's just quickly remind ourselves how. So here's, of course, your calculator. And these are located on the menu. Let's see, where are we? Math. Oh, one second. Um, these functions, or the combina combinatoric functions, let's put it that way. are located on the math app under the PRB probability menu. Okay, so in other words, if you go to the math app and then you scroll over with your arrow key to prob, you scroll down, 
you notice um, it's a pretty long list here of options, but the one for the factor, um, factorials, you're looking for number four. Okay, so in other words, four is factorial. Okay, um, and by the way, while you're we're looking at this, permutations are number two, and it's labeled NPR because you need to provide two pieces of information. The number of objects you're choosing from is N, and R is the number of objects that you're choosing. You always put the, no, the larger collection number first, and then secondly, you put how many objects you're actually choosing. We don't need that here with factorial because you're, of course, choosing the entire set of objects. You're just changing their sequencing. And then with combinations, <clears throat> you also need to provide it with... Um, the number uh, N, 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 um, N and R, and this is number three. By the way, um, this is, I'm using right now this 84 plus CE, the newer version, the one that has the brighter screen, it has color, it has all kinds of fun new things. Sometimes those menus, though, are not identical to the original 84 series. So I'll try to point that out whenever that happens. But here, that's not the case. It's the same for both calculators. Okay. So anyway, um, I think that's as far as we got. Yeah, so we did arrangements, we did combinations, we did permutations. Uh, we and I redefine here for you the notion of factorial to remind you what it stands for, or what it what it means, and then where do you find the functions that you need to calculate factorial or the number of arrangements, permutations, and combinations. So all you really have to do is make sure you pick the right one. All right. So in other words, be very careful and make sure you know whether or not the order of selection matters. If you're choosing from a larger collection, if you're not, then just use factorial. Anyway, so now here's a fun little historical footnote about a very interesting case where all of this turned out to be very important. Now, um, it turns out Ronald Fisher is one of the most famous statisticians in history. He really invented a lot of the things that we take for granted today in the field of statistics. And um, so he had an interesting experience. Now, this is going back to the early 20th century in Cambridge, England. And Fisher was at a party, and um, there were a, a lot of other people uh, there who were, um, you know, high-end members of society, let's say. And um, so it was a tea party. They were drinking tea. And um, all of a sudden, one of the uh, people at this party, Lady Ottoline, as it turns out, complained to the waiter that he was pouring her tea incorrectly. She wanted him to pour her tea first and then the milk second. She was drinking milk tea. She wanted the tea first and the milk second. And he was what he was doing was he was doing it backwards. And so um, Ronald Fisher said to her, well, listen, can you really tell the difference if the tea is poured first and the milk or the milk is poured first? And she said, I certainly can. So being Ronald Fisher, he thought, let's try an experiment and see if she's really right, if she really knows how to tell the difference. So what they decided to do was they, without, you know, in the background where she couldn't see what they were doing, they took eight cups of, of tea and in half the cases, the tea was poured first and in the other half, it was the milk first. So they brought them out to the table where Lady Adeline was sitting there and um, they asked her to determine from each cup after a couple of sips, if the milk had been poured first or the tea. So she wrote down all of her answers and handed them back. And then it turns out she got all eight of them right. <laughs> okay. Now we'll see later on um, how this I determined this, but it turns out that in order to get all eight right by pure guesswork, um, the probability that happening is less than 1%. So that means she obviously knew what she was talking about. So, um, I mean, sure, there's a remote chance that she was just incredibly lucky, but it doesn't look very likely, does it? No. Okay. So in other words, because the chances of her guessing and being successful were so low, Fisher concluded 
that she must know the difference between tea first and milk first. So he wrote about this um, later on, and it appeared in a book about him. So we know that this really happened, but um, but it just shows you how <laughs> he was. That's how you get to be one of the best statisticians of all time. And every time something happens in your life, it, it turns into a statistical experiment. So, but he in this very simple experiment introduced some very important insights, um, like I said, which turned into many of the statistical procedures that we use today. So anyway, let's get back to where we're, all of this, by the way, is just an introduction to what's coming next. Um, what we're really after is not so much the combinatorics, but how they fit in with the two probability distributions that we are studying in this chapter or I'm sorry, not the two, the probability distributions that we're studying, which we will later on extend to some other cases. Remember, we defined the notion of a random variable, which simply means a, a function that assigns numbers to the outcomes of an experiment. And we also introduced the concept of a probability distribution, which means that we're taking all the outcomes of that experiment and assigning them probabilities okay so in other words um we had a simple case with a pair of dice that was rolled twice or a single die that actually was rolled twice and we only were focusing our attention on whether each outcome was even or odd so our sample space consists of ee which is two consecutive evens eo which is even followed by odd oe which is odd followed by even and oo which is clearly two consecutive odds and because each die has three even and three um, odd faces, that means each of these outcomes is equally likely. And so we can summarize these. First, X is the random variable. And you notice here we're assigning for each of these outcomes, X is assigning it a value of, in the first case, two, which represents the number of evens, one for EO, one for OE, and zero for OO. So in other words, X is defined as the number of heads that turn up. This is a random variable. <clears throat> it's taking these letters, or outcomes represented by letters, and turning them into numbers. But then we can take this one step further and calculate the probabilities of each of these outcomes occurring based on the rules of probability. And we can see this table that you're seeing here is actually a very simple example of a probability distribution because we're taking the X's themselves, which are the numbers that came out of the experiment, and we're assigning them all probabilities. And if you notice, each probability has to be somewhere between zero and one. And in addition, all of these have to add up to one. Now, we also mentioned that <clears throat> there's two basic types of probability distributions we might encounter. Uh, discrete means that there's only a finite number of possible outcomes, which means that we can count them. Continuous means there's an infinite number of possibilities, so we can't count them. In this chapter, we're focusing our attention on the discrete cases. We also um, introduce the concept of moments, which describe the properties of a random variable, meaning, um, you know, the behavior of it as the experiments are uh, repeated. We introduce the expected value, the variance, and the standard deviation. And these are comparable to the ones we saw in our discussion about samples and um, populations in the sense that an expected value is simply an average. Okay, and nothing has changed here except the way it's calculated. We're going through all of the possible values of our random variable x. Each one is designated xi. And we multiply it by its corresponding probability, which is pxi. By multiplying them together and adding them up, we have our expected value. Okay, And we did that with the die rolling experiment. Then we have the variance, which is has the same role as it does with the samples and populations, meaning it's a measure of dispersion. How far are the values spread out among the mean or expected value? And its formula is, uh, oh, here we go. X, we take each X, subtract the expected value, square the difference, multiply by the probability, 
and then we add them up when we're done. And here what I've done is handwritten in the equivalent definition for population. You can see the similarities to each other. The difference here is that we're multiplying by probabilities rather than dividing by n. And of course, this part never changes. The standard deviation is nothing but the square root of the variance. Okay, that that it doesn't matter what application we're working with. This is always going to be true. All right. And so then we mentioned that there's many potential discrete probability distributions, but there's two that are particularly important for us, um, which are known as the binomial and the Poisson. But if you're interested in looking at some of the others that are out there, um, Wikipedia actually does a surprisingly good job keeping track of a lot of this information. And um, they have a, a page somewhere where they have a list of different probability distributions with all the different important information, including the probability formula and the moments. And it's all listed together. And some of the um, ones that we'll not be looking at are pretty terrifying to look at. Um, many of the other ones are very highly specialized, though, that they're usually used for very specific situations where here, the binomial and the Poisson could be used in many different cases. They're very uh, powerful. And so the binomial distribution is the one where our experiment can only have two possible outcomes in each trial. That's really what separates it from other discrete distributions. And um, the Poisson, which we haven't gotten to yet, but the Poisson refers to events occurring over a unit of time. Okay, so in other words, think of Poisson as measuring how likely it is that something happens during a given period of time, whereas the binomial is letting us figure out the probability that a specific number of events take place over a given number of trials. All right, so we did introduce the probability formula for the binomial distribution. And this term right here that's highlighted, n choose x it's called, is what got us started in our discussion about combinatorics because that is simply shorthand for choosing n x objects from n objects when the order does not matter. In other words, that symbol represents the number of combinations that can be formed by choosing x objects from n objects. Okay. Now it equals n factorial over x factorial times n minus x factorial. So some books list it like this. Sometimes it's listed with the actual formula there, but either way, that is simply the number of combinations that we can create when choosing x out of n objects. So then we discussed <coughs> combinatorics and how do you find them on our calculators? And there's our example about toppings on our <coughs> Hagen das, a very fun example, I must say. And then somewhere along the way here we had, oh yeah, this is the one where we chose um, the three uh, officers for a club. So here the order in which I chose my numbers did matter because it determined who filled which position. So in this case, we were looking at permutations rather than combinations. All right, so I think we're all caught up now. So we can go back and carry on with our discussion of the binomial distribution. And then when we're done, I'm going to show you a special shortcut that's hiding in this calculator. So yeah, this Ronald Fisher example, we're going to go back later on and revisit it and explain where this number came from. Why is it that getting all eight right out of pure chance would have been a probability of 0.39%. Well, it turns out that it will be based on the binomial distribution. All right, so let's jump ahead here. There's a few more examples of combinations, but let's get back to this. Now, we let's get back to our die rolling experiment. And remember, there's four equally likely outcomes here. And hold on. Okay, now I can tell my uh, tablet is being stubborn today. So hold on one minute.
Uh, that's a little bit more like it. And then we already know that each one of these is equally likely. Now, we also know that X was defined, or we're, let's assume that X is defined to represent the number of times that an even number turns up during the, the experiment. So therefore, just quickly recap this. Oh, I don't think there's enough room here. Hold on. Let's try that again. Um, just, yeah, just a quick reminder that the way this is set up, We have E, 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 O, O, E, and O, O. The corresponding X's are 2, 1, 1, 0. Now, let's start. Let's go through and calculate these probabilities with the binomial distribution. Now, I just want to quickly remind you the requirements for the binomial distribution were... Hold on, I'll find it there. Okay, so in other words, the binomial distribution is based on the so-called binomial experiment. This is a special type of random process, a random experiment that has the following characteristics. The trials are independent of each other, number one. Number two, each trial has only two possible outcomes, success and failure. And number three, the probability of success on a single trial, which we'll write pi in this book at least many books use p but this book uses pi um is a constant from one trial to the next now since we're rolling the die twice i think you'll agree that that experiment qualifies in all three counts in other words the rolls are independent of each other which roll because we're only looking at even and odd um there's only two possible outcomes on each uh roll or trial and the probability of success meaning in this case an even number is one half on every roll, regardless of what has happened on past rolls. That's the key detail. It's always a half. It doesn't matter what happened before. It doesn't matter if you've already gotten 18 evens in a row. Um, unlikely as that is, it's possible. So um, it still has no influence on the next roll. So that means we can use the binomial distribution to figure out the probabilities for x equals 0, 1, and 2. All right, so let's do it. Uh, okay, I just got it. Here we go. We'll start with x equals zero. All right, now. So the, the general formula, if you write it like this, That's what it would look like. So in our case, n is 2 and pi is 1 half. That's not going to change throughout this problem. Those are constants. Every time we try to figure out a new probability, the only thing that will change is the lowercase x. So we're going to have 2 factorial over, again, uh, actually, no, zero factorial. So for this one, x equals zero. Little x, that is. And then we'll have a half, which is pi, to the x power. Now, if you notice here, 
we have one minus pi, but because pi is a half, so is one minus pi. And then the exponent is n minus x, which in this case is two minus zero, which is just two. Now, this one reduces to, uh, actually, this is not enough room. Hold on. It turns out that the first two terms are both equal to one. Okay, because Uh, actually, I should write this as 2 times 1 over. Yeah, everything cancels out. So this is just 1. 0 to the 1 half power is 1. So all that really remains is 0.5 squared, and that's the 0.25. <clears throat> so that reminds me, I'm going to give you show you a couple of quick shortcuts for combina combinatorics, actually, specifically combinations. Um, you choose no objects out of N. So there's the number of ways of choosing no objects from a collection is one. The number of ways of choosing one object from a collection of n is actually n. Okay, because um, here's a note, here's why. So there's all the terms cancel out except for this n. So in other words, if I'm trying to choose, how many ways can I choose one object from 10? It's just 10. It's that simple. I mean, it's complete common sense. How many ways can I pick no objects at all? Just the one. And then how about this one? Check choosing all n objects. All right, so just that you you might want to see some of these quick shortcuts. So in other words, to choose zero objects, there's only one way to do that, to choose one object. There's n ways of doing that. And to choose all n objects, there's just one way. Okay, anyway. Now, what about x equals one? So when you fill everything in, let's see how many combinations there are. Two. So this falls into that category. And uh, see how that worked? Now the other two are 0.5 to the first, 0.5 to the first. So you've got two times a half times a half, and you just end up with a half. Very good. And then finally for two, and this is that special case that I showed you, choosing n objects from n is just one. There's only one way that can happen. 
Yeah, just double checking. Yeah, I wrote it correctly. Um, so that means this first term is one. 0.5 to the squared is 0 0.25. 0 0.5 to the zero is one, and you end up with a quarter. So what we've just done is we've proven in a second way, a second equivalent way, that for this particular experiment, the probability distribution is this. Except this, this time we got it with the, um, oh, sorry, sorry. Whoops, hold on. It's 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0 0.25. So in other words, what because this experiment qualifies as a binomial experiment, we can calculate those probabilities not just by counting up the die rolls, but by using this formula. And when you're only rolling the die twice, um, it hardly matters which approach you use. But what if you're rolling the die 10 times? Well, then count, calculating these probabilities by adding them up, and counting how many different ways each outcome can happen, could start to take a lot of time, as opposed to this formula, which is always the same amount of work, no matter what numbers are involved. Okay, so in other words, the, the more complex the problem is, the more this formula starts to pay for itself is in terms of time and complexity. So there's the, you will almost certainly always end up using this formula rather than trying to count yourself how many uh, different ways, different outcomes can occur. Now, here's that shortcut that I promised you. All of that work that we just did was very enlightening, but it's not necessary because the calculator has thoughtfully provided us with the formula that calculates binomial probabilities. So where is this thing hiding? Uh, so let's go over here. And uh, if you go to second vars, which is where all the probability distributions are hiding that we'll need for this course and the next one, scroll down until you find binomial PDF. And it'll ask you for several key pieces of information. Uh, what are they? Oh, here it is. It, it was right here. By the way, I just want to double check on something. I have the, uh, oh, I should have the other calculator here somewhere. Uh, here it is. I just want to confirm that the menu is the same for the 84 plus and the CE version, because it isn't always, but I think this is one of those cases where they're both identical. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this one, for this one, they're, they're still the same. And you know what, if you notice that it's a little bit off, I mean, if you have the CE and you see that the letter is slightly different, you should still be able to figure out the correct one by the name. You don't really, the letter isn't really that important. What matters is the name of the function. Okay, and be aware that the, between the two calculators, the difference will be at most one. Because here, what's happened is the CE, they've just added a handful of functions here and there. So as far as I can tell, it's not a huge amount. Okay, and I don't think I've seen any cases where there's two additions to the same menu. But anyway, well, let's go to this second VARS binomial PDF, which stands for binomial probability density function. And it's going to ask for the number of trials, which is two, probability success. Now that P is what our book is calling PI. Okay, just be aware that that's pi. The calculator has a certain set of um, notations and not every book follows those, but it should be clear that that must be the probability of success. And the X value is self-explanatory. Make sure it's zero. 
and then hit the paste button, uh, scroll down to paste, hit enter, and then enter again. And it should come up 0.25. Now to do this x equals one, you only have to change the x value. That's kind of nice. So go back. Now, it might be possible in a case like this where you're only changing one thing. You may not have to go through the whole sequence again. Uh, if you hit second enter, now if you notice in the window where your results are, it says binomial PDF 2 comma 0.5 comma 0. If you hit second enter, you can scroll back with your arrow keys and just change that last zero to a one. Hit enter and you've got your answer. Okay, if not, well then just go start all over again. I just want you to be aware that you can edit. Um, I'll, I'll actually write it here. In other words, rather than starting all over again every time, because you're only changing the X. Second, enter. And then arrow key. Back, uh, actually, I should say, you have to use the back arrow key to get back to where you wanted to change. then change the value. That's only gonna save you a couple of seconds, but it's nice to know that it's there. You know what I mean? Like if you're literally only gonna change one thing, um, you might be tempted to try this or else just go back to the beginning. It's because all the numbers will still be there when you go back. Um, it doesn't change anything, even when you turn it off. So um, this is just another shortcut if you want it. And then to get x equals 2, of course, you're going to change just the 2, and you'll end up with 0.25. Very good. So in other words, now you know how to calculate binomial probabilities with algebra, using the formula, that is, or else using the calculator's built-in function. Now, here's something I do want to point out to you, though. On this menu, and this is true in several cases, I'll, I'll make a little warning message here, just in case you're tempted to do the wrong thing. Or not on purpose, of course. Note the second VARS menu. also contains an entry binome CDF. It's right below the binome PDF. This is only used for less than or equal to probabilities, okay? So in other words, don't use it unless you really know what you're doing. Um, for this one, just use PDF, okay? But if you have a case, like let's say, for example, you roll a die 10 times and you wanna know the probability of getting less than or equal to three uh, evens, then you could use this directly without having to calculate each probability individually. But, um, and then you, it, it works exactly the same way, by the way. It's just that the X is interpreted as less than or equal to instead of X by itself, okay? So, um, in fact, why don't I, you might as well, since we're talking about it, I'll show you exactly how that would work. For example, suppose the die is rolled 10 times and 
um, even is defined as a success. The probability of getting three evens or less is computed as, okay. And then you'll notice that it's exactly the same, except you have to go to binome CDF. But this part doesn't change. Second bars B binome CDF. Okay, so it will be second bars. Number letter B is binome PD, CDF. So then it would actually be the trials, which is 10 this time. Probability of success is still a half. X now is three. And just be aware that this is interpreting it as. <clears throat> X is less than or equal to three. Hmm. And down here, of course, this would now be C D F. And you'd have ten, a half, and three. And that would equal. Point seventeen nineteen, let's say. We'll round it to point seventeen nineteen. All right. So in other words, that just saved you calculating four probabilities. The probability of x equals zero, one, two, and three, and adding them up. So that's the only time you would ever use that function. I shouldn't say that. There might be other cases where it could be useful, but most of the time that's what you want to do with it. All right, now it's time to revisit the teacup example. What happened here, now that we really understand the binomial distribution, just think about this with the cups. There are eight cups of tea set up by Ronald Fisher. They were independently chosen without any pattern to them at all to have four with tea first and four with milk first. Each one could be considered a trial. And on each one, there's a 0.5% chance, 50%, I should say, or 0.5 chance of it being tea first or milk first. So you've got eight trials, each of which is independent of the others. And the probability of success is 0.5 in each case. We want to find out the chances of getting all eight successes, eight successes out of eight trials. So you go back to your calculator, type in the numbers in binome PDF, and you say, oh, it's true, 0 0.0039. Sometimes in the past, um, the binomial distribution has been used to see if people are cheating on tests because um, <laughs> what they're essentially trying to find out is whether or not people are getting answers right by pure luck or else something else strange is going on. But um, here, what we're seeing here is that she's, there's no way she's going to get eight out of eight right unless she knows what she's talking about. Or at least we could say the probability isn't literally zero, but it's so close that we can probably dismiss it. And that raises an interesting question in all of statistics. We're never going to ever have complete certainty. We're always going to have to figure out what do we define as an acceptable level of uncertainty. And here, I think we've reached that level. Now, there are more formal tests we could use to determine whether or not, um, you know, this was the result of guesswork. 
but it looks pr pretty bad. In other words, I would say that we can all agree that Lady Adeline knows the difference between the two. Now, I've met other people who are tea drinkers, and not one of them claimed that they could tell the difference. I don't know why she could tell, but apparently there's something about the way the two liquids combine. One of them is probably denser than the other. I guess it affects the taste. And a true tea connoisseur, I guess, could tell the difference. All right. <laughs> so anyway, now I did mention earlier that like um, what we saw in earlier chapters with summary measures that are designed to help us explain the properties of a sample in a population with random variables. Instead, we have something called moments. And we did talk about this earlier. Let's just quickly remind ourselves that somewhere along the way, we defined expected value, the variance and the standard deviation. And for any discrete random variable X, <clears throat> these formulas will give us the answer we're looking for. Okay. Not a problem. So there's no problem there. But here's the great news here. When we are dealing with the binomial distribution, we don't have to mess around with those formulas. It turns out that there's some very convenient shortcut formulas that we can use instead. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look. All right, hold on. Let me find it again. Here we go. So with the expected value, we just have to multiply n, the number of trials, by the probability of success. Now, by the way, this is taking place. This is only possible, made possible, by the fact that the trials are independent of each other. Right? In the other cases, we're not assuming that. Here we are. So we can just say, well, if there's 10 trials, or for example, we're flipping a coin 10 times, the chance, and there's a 50% chance of getting ahead, then after 10 flips, on average, we should get five heads. It's that simple. That's how you think about this. Or in the case of Lady Online, it means that we would have expected her to get four of the cups correctly just by guessing, but she did get all eight of them. Now, what about the variance? It also has its own wonderful shortcut formula. And that would be n times pi times 1 minus pi. And that implies <clears throat> that the standard deviation is the square root, which is, of course, the square root of n pi 1 minus pi. So in the case of the die rolling experiment, where we roll the die twice and even is counted as a success, on average, when we roll the die twice, we'll get one even number. Okay, n times pi would be two times a half. The variance, n times pi times one minus pi is a half. As you can see, two times a half times a half. And then of course, that means that the standard deviation is simply the square root of that. Very good. Now, here's something I want you to see. Now, I think we mentioned this a couple of times already. There are certain graphs that lend themselves very nicely to helping us visualize what a probability distribution looks like. For discrete random variables, um, the best choice is often what's called a histogram, which is essentially a bar chart where the, the bars are vertical. And um, so what ends up happening is that you've got bars, one for each value, var value of x, Let's say you have something like this. Here's x. On the vertical axis, the probability of x. This is some generic probability distribution. It could be anything. Okay, now I'm not drawing it that well. The, the bar should have the same width. Let me see if I can clean that up a bit. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's normally how it works. Like, let's say this bar is meant to represent zero. This is one. This is two. This is three. And let's say this is four. And this is five. This would be a classic example of a histogram that illustrates X, some random variable X. 
And so this is actually a picture of X's probability distribution, but with bars instead of a table. So you can see at a glance what the distribution looks like. So let's say we have a binomial experiment where there are 10 trials. And what we're going to do is look at a different graph for each possible value of pi, the probability of success. All right, so remember there's 10 trials. So the first graph, pi is 0.2. So this is a, an experiment where the probability of success is pretty low. So you can see most of the outcomes are six or less, although you can't really see it, but there's actually a tiny bit of blue on seven, eight, nine, and 10. It's barely visible. Even six is pretty hard to see. So the majority of these outcomes are between zero and five. And you see, this is what it looks like. Most of the outcomes, two is the most likely outcome, followed closely by one and then three. So you can see, this is a uh, binomial experiment with a very low probability of success. Now, what if I raise that to 0.5? Uh -huh. Now, this is a little different. In fact, you're going to see now this distribution is symmetrical about the mean. meaning that if you draw a line down the center, the area on the right and the area on the left are mirror images of each other. So the probability of getting, let's say, four and six is the same, three and seven is the same, two and eight is the same, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, that's going to prove to be important later on. You'll see why. Okay, we'll save that for later. <laughs> and then finally, you can probably guess what's coming next. If I raise the pi now, to 0.7. Oh, see, this is the opposite of the 0.2, isn't it? Yes, most of the outcomes are here. And again, there's a tiny little, you can barely see it, but there's area for 0, 1, and 2. Then 3 is slightly popping up. And then all of these, um, you can see the most likely outcome is 7, followed by 8 and the others. So, it's kind of like a baby's teeth popping up down there. <laughs> All right. Now, so yes, we often use histograms to give us at a glance um, a key look into the properties of that probability distribution. All right. Now, there's a second discrete probability distribution that we'd like to study in this chapter. And that is known as Poisson, the Poisson distribution. As I said before, this one involves time. Specifically, we want to know the probability that a certain number of events occurs over a given unit of time. Um, let me give you some examples that you might use with the prob uh, Poisson distribution. For example, computing the probability that um, Let's say you live near an airport that a given number of planes will fly over your house in the next hour. Well, now, uh, if you're not near an airport, this is not a very good example, but that would be something you could um, use for the Poisson distribution because you're thinking about intervals of time, meaning an hour, and the event is that a plane flies over your house. Okay, um, if you're not near an airport, then, the answer, then this probably never happens. But in some areas, this happens quite regularly. But that would be something you could model with the Poisson distribution. Or, oh, there's so many possibilities, like... Um, How about um, computing the probability that uh, a given number of customers 
enters a store during a given week. Again, it's because the event is customers come in the door and the time frame is a week. Okay. Oh, I'm sure you can think of plenty of your own examples. Now, having said that though, we have to be careful um, because just as the binomial distribution is based on several key assumptions. Remember what they were, the in, number of independent trials, um, probability of success is the same, okay? And there's only two possible outcomes. The Poisson distribution is based on the assumption that each interval of time is independent of all other intervals of time. So there's, in order to really and truly use it properly for measuring the probability that X planes will go over your house in the next hour, it must be the case that it doesn't matter if it's nine o'clock in the morning or three o'clock uh, in the afternoon to be truly uh, following the Poisson distribution. Now, that may not be strictly speaking true, but if it's close, uh, you should get a reasonably accurate probability by using the Poisson distribution. I should say the same thing with uh, binomial. We see it used sometimes in cases where it's not strictly 100% based on correct assumptions. Sometimes, you know, we, we have to use it because it's the best uh, distribution that's available, that the assumptions are not perfectly met. But the reality is you almost never get perfection in, in, in statistics. In other words, remember statistics is an empirical science. It's based on what's happening in the real world. So, you know, it's, it, it's an art form in the sense that you're trying to do the best job to explain what's happening in the real world with the techniques that you have. Um, with the understanding that, you know, it, it's never going to be perfect. You're never going to get 100% certainty. So in other words, we want the assumptions to be as closely met as possible. All right, well, anyway, with all that being said, how do we use this mysterious Poisson distribution? Which by the way, is named after its inventor. He's a famous mathematician. Um, Poisson is the French word for fish, but I mean, it is the, the name of the man who invented this technique. I don't know if anyone knows who invented the bi binomial distribution. A lot of results in math and statistics um, were developed not by a single individual, but over time. One researcher would come up with an interesting idea, and then later on, somebody would build on it, and somebody else would build on it. And eventually, somebody would publish a paper with the final result. And often, that person would be credited with this discovery, but it's very possible that they were not really responsible for it. All right, now, here is... The Poisson distribution. Now, like all distributions, it has a formula that we'll use to come up with our appropriate probabilities. This one is a little bit different. Oh, now we're talking about some interesting new developments. So what's going on here? Well, this is our old friend, of course, factorial. And by the way, X is the number of events whose probability were calculated. That hasn't changed. This is the new part. This is the Greek letter lambda. And it represents the average number of events that occur per unit of time. For example, with the airplanes, suppose that we discover from the experience that on average two airplanes go over your house every hour. From historical experience, I mean, um, or suppose the a store is has seen that on average they get 500 customers coming into the store every week. 
that's historical information. And we're going to use that in this formula. So uh, let's see, where's our, here we go. Let's do our first example. Suppose that we have someone who on average receives one message on their phone every hour. And again, we're assuming implicitly that every hour is independent of the other hours. In other words, the likelihood of getting a certain number of calls is not being influenced by what time of the day it is. Although, of course, in reality, that might not be the case. But like I said, we're going to, we have to live with some uncertainty here. So we're going to use the uh, Poisson distribution. And when I tell you that the number of cell phones per hour is one, that tells us that lambda equals one. That's what it means. What's then the probability of getting two in the next hour? Okay, good question. All right, so remember the formula is Oh, there it is, okay. Oops, that's two. I, I guess I don't even have to do this. You've got e to the minus one power. Remember that one is the lambda. Two is the x. Two factorial. So this one's pretty straightforward. e to the minus one. One, this is one over two, by the way, because two factorial is just two. And of course, one squared is just one. Uh, now, by the way, e is on your calculator here too. Um, let's find it. Here it is. Oh, I don't know if you can see that, but see where your four is. Oh my God. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm not sure if you can even see that, but I, I'll tell you what's going on there directly. Direct next to your four, now I know that it's backwards, is the natural log right there, ln, natural log, directly above it in the tiniest imaginable print, it says e to the x. Yes, I know it's backwards, but it's e to the x. So if you hit second and this button, you'll get e to the x, okay? Four over here. So hit second natural log, e to the x. So now the way this calculator works is that if you hit second, log it'll produce a little window of uh, it'll, it'll look like this it's set when you hit second ln it'll say e and there'll be a little tiny box here for you to put your uh, exponent so you're going to of course type negative one there and don't forget on this calculator the negative comes first Okay, um, uh, actually, let me draw it like this. And also, some people get the negative and the minus uh, confused with each other. On this calculator, the negative button is this one. It's directly below the three. Don't get them backwards or you'll get error messages every time. To tell it that you want negative one, you hit the negative button and then the one. <clears throat> okay. Negative one, enter, and you're going to get approximately 0.3678, let's say eight. Okay. Then, of course, if you notice how here it's telling you that you're going to now multiply that by 0.5, and that should give you approximately. 0.18395. So that is um, our first example of the Poisson distribution. Now, if I wanted to know the probability of getting a third phone call, what would I do differently?
All right, here's what you'd have to do. By the way, I just want to point out that um, these are both the same thing. These are, I'm going to make three. I found in the past that this makes people nervous for some reason. Um, yeah, you've got, you're in the numerator, what you're basically doing is multiplying e to the minus lambda times lambda to the x, and whatever that result is, you're dividing it by x factorial. So you're going to have, remember, lambda is 1. Because he gets an average of one phone call an hour or one message. E to the minus lambda, lambda to the x over x factorial would be e to the minus one, one over. Now, three factorial is, of course, three times two times one, which is six. So you've got this point, uh, as we just calculated earlier, point three. Six plus my place three six seven eight seven nine divided by six is approximately equal to point oh six one three one. Okay. And they're all done exactly the same way. All right, so you just need to be comfortable with that e to the x key in order to do this properly. It's not that difficult, but um, you just have to get used to the way your calculator works. That's all. Now, of course, I'm sure you're hoping that I'm going to tell you that there's a shortcut formula in here. And of course, there is um, not so much a shortcut, but uh, a function built onto this menu. It's the same menu that we use for the binomial distribution that calculates these formulas directly. So let's reveal the location of this function. Go to second vars, go all the way down. It's below binome. I think it's way... Now, by the way, this is one case where I believe menu is slightly different for the CE and the regular uh, 84. It is... On um, this, uh, yeah, I knew it. Um, okay, I'm glad this came up. On the original calculator, it was C. Because they sneaked in a new function here somewhere, I and B binome. Um, It's D on the on this calculator. Okay. So, you know, I'm sure you wouldn't get confused. You wouldn't be looking at the letter instead of the name, but um, you know, just in case you didn't know, just be aware that this is one of the small differences between the two calculators. So go to that one. And if you choose it, you'll see that it's only going to need to know three things. Oh, here's something else I recently discovered. This is something that really surprised me to no end. I um, I can't even begin to imagine why they made this decision. Lambda is always used to represent Poisson. And yet somehow these guys on the 84 CE decided that instead of calling this Lambda, they're going to call it Mu. I'd like to meet the person who made this decision because mu is almost always used to be the population mean. You're just going to confuse people. <clears throat> but I'm not in charge of Texas Instruments. So anyway, just be aware that it's the same thing. This is the lambda, the mean number of events per unit of time. Okay. So um, 
then you have x. Now, this is the case where x equals 2, which we already determined to be 0.18394. Choose 1 and 2. <laughs> and it's the same that we got. It's approximately 18394. And then if you want to try your hand at x equals 3, like we did, you're going to have lambda or mu, as the case may be. And it will give us back the answer. Okay, I'm I'm getting um, oh six one three one. Okay. And that's what we got, isn't it? We got, um, when we did it the hard way, yeah, that's exactly what we got. Good. And the other one, 1839. Yeah. By the way, and, and of course here too, there does exist on the same menu And this is something just so you might uh, look out for it. On the same menu that contains Poisson PDF, there is a Poisson, there is an entry for Poisson CDF, which is only used for less than or equal to probabilities. In other words, only use it when you're sure that it's like say let's for that phone call case if you wanted to know less than or equal to three or something like that then you could use the Poisson CDF but that's the only time don't get them confused with each other all right and then finally what we're going to do here is look at the way moments are calculated for the Poisson distribution now remember we saw at the very beginning let's review this one more time The moments for any discrete distribution look like this. All right, this one always works, but it isn't necessary when you're dealing with either the binomial or the Poisson because they have their own special shortcut formulas. Now that one, you're especially happy not to have to do the, the formula, I'm thinking. And then of course, the standard deviation is simply the square root. And let's just quickly remind ourselves what these moments look like for the binomial distribution. Okay, it's down here somewhere. Hold on. There we go. Um, the three formulas were n pi for expected value, n pi one minus pi, and then finally square root of that. So the formulas are even easier if you can believe it for the Poisson distribution. It's hard to believe, but it's true. Watch this. For the Poisson distribution, the formulas for the moments are the expected value is lambda. And that makes sense because remember, we defined the lambda to be the expected or average value or average number of events that occur per unit of time. But here's the bizarre part. The variance is also equal to lambda, which means that the standard deviation is just the square root of lambda. Wow. So that means for that last case, the cell phone example with the lambda of one, all three of these are equal to one. How do you like that? <laughs> so that's an unusually simple case. All right. Now, finally, we can wrap this up with uh, our look at histograms for the Poisson distribution. Now, this time, we're only going to need to change the lambda for, from one um, graph to the next. So we're going to try lambda equals 1, 2, and 5, just to give you a feel for what they look like. 
with lambda equals one, you can see the chances of uh, the probability of x equaling zero and one are the most likely. Two is somewhat less likely, and then it falls off very, very quickly. So there's a very low chance of it being three or four. And after that, the numbers are so small, you can't even see them. If I increase that to two, it essentially shifts the shape to the right. See how one and two are the most common, although three and zero are also very likely, followed by four, five, and six. And then look at five. Five is very interesting because this is starting to look somewhat symmetrical, although not really, but very much more than the other two. That's for sure. Four and five are equally likely. And then you've got a very high probability of getting six or three. So this is what five looks like. All right. So that is our discussion for discrete probability distributions. Now, um, there are many others, as I said, but these are the most important ones. The others are a lot more specialized, so we'll just focus our attention on these. So what I'm planning on doing is for the next session, what I'd like to do is take a step back and maybe run through some um, examples of both distributions just to get more practice. And then we're going to move into chapter seven, which is our discussion about continuous distributions, where the most important of them all is the normal distribution by a long shot the normal distribution is the most important of all really of all distributions because it's used more than any other in in practice so we're heading into some very deep waters now so all right um i guess we'll stop right here and the next time i see you we'll do some practicing with a plus on a binomial and then we'll dive into some really deep waters with the normal distribution. Luckily though, <laughs> this will help us enormously with the normal distributions. In fact, the more deeply we get into this material, the more this calculator is going to help you, okay? I just want you to know that. So just be aware that the scarier the material, the more helpful the calculator will be. All right, so I'll see you all next time. <laughs>